Hi, thank you all so much for being here. Um, so this is a, an attempt to compress a class that I taught last, taught last semester at the University of Michigan called The Art of the Uncanny. And there's a scholar here who actually was in that class. And um, so I guess I just want to say, if you happen to be here, you feel, feel free to take a nap. It's nothing you haven't heard before. Um, this is the only time I would ever say that, but none of the rest of you can take a nap, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> This is also the first time that I've ever done PowerPoint before, ever in my whole life. Um, but I got very, thank you. Thank you, I got very inspired and intimidated by um, those of y'all who have used PowerPoint in your lectures this week, so I'm just trying to be like y'all. Um, and shout out to Allison C. Rollins, who assured me that I could do it. Um, if you see me in a panic doing this a lot, it's because I don't have faith in the system. But, but do you have faith in the system? Okay, so what I want to start with is, um, uh, I lost all of my, all of my brain cells just went out of my head for a second. Um, I want to start with establishing the definition of the uncanny and then look at a few examples. But I, before that, I wanted to actually start with a couple of images because one of the reasons I wanted to teach about the uncanny is because we were living in such an uncanny time, we still are. And um, one of the things I realized as I started researching the uncanny is that familiarity and return is actually deeply a part of the uncanny. So I just wanted to start with a couple of images from a very different timeline, but of course, as you can see, um, they're very um, terrifyingly recognizable, especially right now. Okay, so Sigmund Freud has this essay called The Uncanny. If you are interested at all in aesthetics, I strongly recommend reading it. Um, but I'm going to mostly be basically just the next few slides are direct quotes from that essay, just some of his um, establishing of the definition of the uncanny, and I'm just gonna read it. The subject of the uncanny undoubtedly belongs to all that is terrible, to all that arouses dread and creeping horror. It is equally certain too that the word is not always used in a clearly definable sense, so that it tends to coincide with whatever excites dread. I think both the idea of dread and excitement are important to keep in mind here. Yet we may expect that it implies some intrinsic quality which justifies the use of a special name. One is curious to know what this peculiar quality is, which allows us to distinguish as uncanny certain things within the boundaries of what is fearful. Am I going too fast? Okay. The uncanny is that class of the terrifying which leads back to something long known to us, once very familiar. The German word unheimlich is obviously the opposite of heimlich, heimisch meaning familiar, native, belonging to the home. And we are tempted to conclude that what is uncanny is frightening precisely because it is not known and familiar. Naturally, not everything which is new and unfamiliar is frightening. However, the relation cannot be inverted. That last part I'll come back to. I think that's very important. We can only say what is novel can easily become frightening and uncanny. Some new things are frightening, but not by any means at all. Something has to be added to what is novel and unfamiliar to make it uncanny. I want to pause here to comment on that to say that this was really compelling to me as an idea because I think sometimes we think about the uncanny as strange and that strangeness and unfamiliarity have some kind of relationship. But Freud makes this point that perhaps it is actually the familiar um, that is more invested. And then in this essay, he goes into a breakdown of a definition of Heimlich specifically. And my German's not great. I don't even know German, so I'm not even gonna say it's great. But um, also Heimlich, Heinelig, belonging to the house, not strange, familiar, tame, intimate, comfortable, homely, etc. And a few sub-definitions, belonging to the house or the family. Of animals, tame, companionable to man as opposed to wild. Friendly, intimate, homelike, 
the enjoyment of quiet content, etc., arousing a sense of peace and security. Concealed, kept from sight, so that others do not get to know about it, withheld from others, secret. And then I included this part because I've always thought this part of the essay was kind of strange and beautiful um, because of the repetition here, so I'm just gonna read it. To do something Heimlich, i.e. behind someone's back, to steal away Heimlich, Heimlich meetings and appointments, to look on with Heimlich pleasure at someone's discomfiture, to sigh or weep Heimlich, to behave Heimlich, as though there was something to conceal, Heimlich love, love affair, sin, Heimlich places, which good manners oblige us to conceal. Unheimlich, by contrast, or not by contrast at all, as we'll see, is defined simply as uneasy, eerie, and blood curdling. Okay. So, those of you who know what that is, yeah. Okay. So, um, I just want to comment here about the fact that Unheimlich is not a direct antonym to Heimlich. It's in fact kind of an enhancement of it, um, which goes back to Freud's idea that something must be added in order to create that feeling of Unheimlich, to change, to transform the familiar into the unfamiliar means, I think, that a layer of anxiety has to be added. That goes back to that idea of excitement and dread, which I think uh, excitement plus dread is probably a pretty good approximation of the experience of anxiety in the first place. But I was fascinated by the fact that in order for the uncanny to occur, you have to have what's familiar. You can see how much um, how much breakdown and how many um, subsections, sub-definitions the original Heimlich has about how Unheimlich is actually just uneasiness, just terror. The uncanny then is not the unfamiliar per se, but the familiar recast in a precarious light. So how as writers might we achieve some of these effects? I wanna talk first about perspective, which means that I wanna talk a little bit about persona and um, to prime us for that, to look at some of the poems that I wanna talk about, I wanna show this clip from um, an episode of Black Mirror, which I find to be a very uncanny show. Um, and if I had time, I would have also shown ships, clips from uh, The Twilight Zone and this uh, show that um, Nate Marshall introduced me to recently called uh, Love, Death, and Robots, which I also wanna recommend as um, great, great uh, content for this particular topic. So I'm just gonna play, these are two short clips, it'll add up to about five minutes total. And, oh, okay. And hopefully the sound will work. Oh no, we're having technical difficulties. Is there something I can do to make this work? There we go, thank you. Hey, man. Hey, you still awake? You want a game? Sorry, let me give a little bit of context because I'm just showing a particular excerpt. So basically the premise of this show, is, of this episode, is that two old friends, both of whom identify as heterosexual, um, are, uh, play this game basically in which they have these avatars that can interact with the edge of the virtual reality game, um, and one of them is married. Hey, man. Hey, you still awake? You want a game? Maybe not tonight. I was, uh... Oh, come on. What are you playing? Something goddamn boring is what I'm guessing. All right. You got me. All right. So, grab the experience disc I got you. Put it on and jump in. Seriously, man. It's insane. You're gonna freak. You're gonna shit your pelvis through your asshole. Okay, what do I do? All right. Uh, they showed me in the store. You put the game chip in. 
Done. Now grab the disc doohickey and stick it upside the head. Left or right side? Doesn't matter. Done. Okay. Now hold down the sync button on the controller. Nothing's happening. We haven't chosen our fighters yet. So I am rock set. Okay. So where's my guy? Lance. Hey, all right, Lance. Let's go. Okay. You have to brace yourself. Brace myself. Come on. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Three, two. So this next clip is um, a mashup of some moments that then follow. Hmm. Sorry, still not used to this. Fight! Whoa, hold on a minute. Is this going to hurt? The game emulates all physical sensations. Is that a yes or no? Because! Don't worry, it resets. No harm done. That's messed up. Round two. Hold on a moment. Shit, right. I'm rusty. Oh, I can't even remember what moves this guy can do. Come on, he's like right in the bike. See? Nice block. Thanks. Okay, anyway, they end up making out. Um, is, really, <laughs> is really the important part of life is that they end up making out. And, um, and then it becomes like this very, it's, it's, if you haven't seen the episode, it's, it's pretty um, anxiety provoking to watch it because they're sort of, you see them sort of grappling with who they are in real life and who they are in this virtual reality. And, um, because they identify as heterosexual, there's also this kind of added layer of like, well, are they having an identity crisis now? There's this very moving scene where um, they actually try to do it, they try to share a kiss in real life, and um, it ends up not working. Um, in real life, it's only in this particular world. So I wanted to show this in part because I think um, the layer of anxiety that is added here to the familiar is that these are two old friends who have obviously encountered each other many times, which we see in the first clip, the way they speak to each other, um, and then they are in completely unfamiliar territory, and then you see basically what happens to, um, to the way that they see not just themselves, but each other um, in this new kind of like heightened state of anxiety, but it's also very exciting, obviously, at the same time. So I want to leap from there to um, a poem by David Wojohn, who, full disclosure, uh, was a teacher of mine at VCU. And um, I want to look at this poem, which I've always found incredibly, um, in incredibly uncanny. And if I can, where's my... And these are um, in, in y'all's handout, so if you feel like 
obviously spending some time with it later, that's, that's possible. I'm just gonna read this poem um, and then I'll talk a little bit about it. Tristia Sam Walton in Hell, after Ovid. I offer again my petition, Lord. Permit me release from this place, better though it is by far than my many years of vagrancy upon the astral plane of drifting shapeless through the void. Thy mercies are great, Lord, and mysterious, and thus I offer thanks. In thy mercy you allowed me rebirth, to wake one morning in the entirely serviceable body of Ida J. J. McGee, 5'2", 170 pounds, your humble servant and single mother of two of no fixed address, residing in a 1990 Toyota Corolla, and employed as a cashier in the Walmart Supercenter of Pontus, Florida, famed of its strip malls, gun and pawn shops, its ABC stores pulsing neon. I write this at 5, p 5 a.m. The first rays of sun rear up behind the fan palms and the public beach dumpster beside which I have parked. Tyrone and Jamie in their sleeping bag have been kicking in dream, their asthma less severe now that spring has come. Soon I will wake them for a breakfast of sugar pops and Dr. Pepper and at six deliver them to the trailer of Senora Lopez. Apron, name tag, smiley face badge. Buzz yourself in, look long into the video cam as the handbook instructs. Make sure to let a daily memorize your face. Failure to follow the time card protocol exactly will result in deducted pay or disciplinary action. Kerching, kerching, extension cord and tampon. 4T briefs emblazoned with the mask of Spider-Man, ammo in carton and potato chip in tube, face of Hamilton and beard of Lincoln food stamps torn from booklets, swipe card now, your receipt, your receipt is being printed. Break 10 minutes exactly. By time theft, we mean personal conversation of any nature conducted during shift, for example, with a fellow employee, while bagging or attaching price tags. Failure to comply may result in reassignment, demotion, or, termi or termination. 12 hours, Lord, and again the next day and the next and the next. The sweat will glisten on my face, the hairnet stick. Senora Lopez will wave from the screen door as I stub my cigarette. Time of the day when the children scarcely know me. Jamie with a fever, Tyrone with a bloody knee. How far have I journeyed to reach this place? How distant the McMansions of Bentonville, the gas grills and the plasma screens, the SUVs of plenty. Allow me my repentance, Lord. I do not ask to be restored to my former station, only a bed, a permanent abode, efficiency or single bedroom. From the gulf, the wind is rising, quickening the palms, rattling the dumpster as it quivers on its rusty wheels. Soon the children will startle awake. The full sun flares upon this page. Already the dashboard is too hot to touch. So this poem is crazy to me, right? Because, so it's written from the perspective of Sam Walton who has been reincarnated into the body of a Walmart employee who is a woman. And David Wojan is a male writer. And I bring that up to say because I always thought this poem was like risky as hell. Um, and I think that in some ways I was sort of like, is, is he allowed to do this? Like he was my teacher and I was still sort of like, I don't know if he's allowed to do this. I don't know how I feel about it. Um, but. I feel like this poem is successful because of that layer where we are, we are consciously thinking through the perspective of both Sam Walton and this other figure simultaneously. And there's something about that doubling of perspective, I think, that really um, sort of like does kind of like almost like um, put Sam Walton in the place we all want him to be in in a strange way. Um, so justice is kind of served, at least in the world of this poem. Um, and I want to bring this poem to y'all's attention in part because I think that um, often as writers we're sort of always wondering what perspectives we are allowed to write from and I, I think that this is a clear example of sometimes the risk is really worth it even if it's clumsy, even if, um, you know, I think like um, David Wojohn who I'm like really resisting trying to call him the Woj as I'm talking about um, this poem but I'm not going to do that um, but I guess I just did. Anyway, uh, if you know, if, if you know David, just tell him I say hello. Um, anyway, uh, but but I think that you know I 
I think that David Wojohn could, could be obviously um, accused of appropriation and, and rightly so in some ways by writing this poem, but, uh, but I, I think that to achieve the uncanny, to achieve the effect of the canny, I think that is a risky business in the first place because you are um, dealing with uh, this concept of familiarity and trying to vex the concept of familiarity. And I think that, um, I think that takes a lot of risk. Moving on to a poem by um, Natalie Diaz called My Brother at 3 AM. And I'm just going to make sure I'm where I need to be in my notes. Okay. And again, I'm just gonna read this poem. I normally wouldn't read poems this quickly, but I'm just kind of trying to throw these at y'all and hopefully you'll have a chance to have um, more time with these poems later. My Brother, brother at 3 AM by Natalie Diaz. He sat cross-legged, weeping on the steps when mom unlocked and opened the front door. Oh God, he said, oh God, he wants to kill me, mom. When mom unlocked and opened the front door at 3 a.m., she was in her nightgown. Dad was asleep. He wants to kill me, he told her, looking over his shoulder. 3 a.m. and in her nightgown, dad asleep. What's going on, she asked. Who wants to kill you? He looked over his shoulder. The devil does, look at him, over there. She asked, what are you on? Who wants to kill you? The sky wasn't black or blue, but the green of a dying night. The devil, look at him, over there. He pointed to the corner house. The sky wasn't black or blue, but the dying of night. Stars had closed their eyes or sheathed their knives. My brother pointed to the corner house. His lips flickered with sores. Stars had closed their eyes or sheathed their knives. Oh God, I can see the tail, he said. Oh God, look. Mom winced at the sores on his lips. It's sticking out from behind the house. Oh God, see the tail, he said. Look at the goddamn tail. He sat cross-legged, weeping on the front steps. Mom finally saw it, a hellish vision. My brother, oh God, oh God, she said. This poem, I think, performs such a chilling act of transformation right before our very eyes. And those of you who are um, formal nerds, this is obviously a villanelle, which is a very obsessive form um, because of the repetitions and how it's built, which I think contributes to this unsettling feeling of this transformation that's happening. We see, we see these images turning and turning and twisting through the poem until this final conclusion where um, the devil that the brother is seeing is seen by the mother as the brother. So in that way, the brother actually becomes the devil by the end of the poem. The brother himself is the hellish vision. And you know, one can perhaps make implications, um, make conclusions based on the content here that perhaps um, the brother is experiencing mental health problems. Perhaps the drugger, the, the brother um, has, is potentially suffering from addiction. We don't know for sure, but we do know that um, his experience of the world and the mother's experience of the world are simultaneously parallel, approximate, and completely separate at the same time. And I think that leads and contributes to the feeling of uncanniness here because again, we're seeing a doubling of perspective um, as well as the familiarity of a family, a brother, a mother, a father, and yet, and of course, um, the narrator who is the sister who is observing all of this transformation happening and documenting it. There are a couple of poems in this packet um, we're not gonna get a chance to get to, unfortunately, but um, Song by Bridget Pegeen Kelly, I think is also a poem that um, counts as the uncanny. And um, one of the, and also connects to that definition of the uncanny, which we won't talk about much today, but the idea of, fam of um, animals, I think is so interesting. I think, um, I think animals and our relationship to animals is also a potential site for a lot of this um, examination. So the next aspect I wanna focus on, I've talked about perspective a little bit, I've talked about image a tiny bit, um, and now I wanna talk a little bit about time and the dynamics of time. Where are my notes about that? Um, so this is an excerpt from Jesmyn Ward's novel, Sing, Unburied, Sing, which is a tremendous book and I think a really necessary read if you haven't read it. A tiny bit of context, this excerpt I'm gonna read is from the perspective of a ghost who um, in real, like, 
is basically haunting and attached to this, um, this family, and only the children can really see him and experience him. Um, but the ghost also has a strong connection to the children's grandfather. Um, and I won't talk about the relationship too much between the grandfather and um, the ghost because I want, I want you to read this book and that would be a spoiler, so I'm not gonna say anything about it. But, um, but uh, so this is a ghost that has been sort of attached to this family for a very, very long time. And this excerpt is written from the ghost's perspective. And Parchment is the name of the prison um, where he and the grandfather met and where he was ultimately killed. I didn't understand time either when I was young. How could I know that after I died, Parchment would pull me from the sky? How could I imagine Parchment would pull me to it and refuse to let go? And how could I conceive that Parchment was past, present, and future all at once? That the history and sentiment that carved the place out of the wilderness would show me that time is a vast ocean and that everything is happening at once. I was trapped, as trapped as I'd been in the room of pines where I woke up. Trapped as I was before the white snake, the black vulture came for me. Parchment had imprisoned me again. I wandered the new prison, night after night. It was a place bound by cinder blocks and cement. I watched the men fuck and fight in the dark, so twisted up in each other, I couldn't tell where one man ended and another began. I spent so many turns of earth, of the earth at the new parchment. I watched for the dark bird, but he was absent. I despaired, burrowed into the dirt, slept, and rose to witness the newborn parchment. I watched chained men clear the land and lay the first logs for the first barracks of gunmen and trusty shooters. I thought I was in a bad dream. I thought that if I burrowed and slept and woke again, I would be back in the new parchment. But instead, when I slept and woke, I was in the delta before the prison, and native men were ranging over that rich earth, hunting and taking breaks to play stickball and smoke. Bewildered, I burrowed and slept and woke to the new parchment again, to men who wore their hair long and braided to their scalps, who sat for hours in small windowless rooms, staring at big black boxes, big black boxes that streamed dreams. Their faces in the blue light were stiff as corpses. I burrowed and slept and woke many times before I realized this was the nature of time. So I share this piece because I think that to go back to the idea of familiarity, one of the subsets I think of is, of time is the idea of nostalgia. And you see that the speaker here is, um, the ghost is describing living through and witnessing many cycles without being able to necessarily interact with those cycles. And it makes me think a little bit more about that Natalie Diaz poem about being these cycles that this family is going through together. And in this particular novel, there are many cycles that the family is always going through. And those turns, I think, and how we experience time inside of those turns, I think is important as well to thinking about the uncanny. And this question of who remembers what and how, I think is also an aspect of that. I'm sure all of y'all have experienced this very off-putting thing that happens where you have a shared memory with someone and they remember something totally different. And sometimes you're like, we did not, we weren't even in the same reality. My version of that memory is so very different than yours. And I think sometimes I have felt very like, well, what does that, what does that mean? We know memory is precarious anyway, um, but history attempts not to be. Um, and I think that, that uh, the connections between history, memory, and nostalgia are um, not only part of our experience of time, but also part of how we um, encounter repeatedly uh, ourselves in situations and contexts and realities that are um, familiar and um, in each new turn uh, potentially jarring and off-putting depending on where we are in space and time. An example of this is actually that my first time here as Swanee was not um, as an attendant of the Writers' Conference, though I was here as a scholar in 2011 or 2012, something like that. But my cousin went here as an undergraduate, and I was an undergraduate at the time, too. So my first experience of Swanee was actually very late at night in like a random part of campus where she was living. And we went to some student pub that had um, really great chicken tenders, I have to say, like really good chicken tenders. Um, and I, I have like a chicken tender problem, but um, this is not a lecture about that, so I'm not gonna talk any more about it. But, um, but so returning to Swanee, for example, has been um, really interesting, and, and every turn here has been 
uh, has been slightly different and um, different in ways that are not just uh, not that they're not just that they're unpredictable, but um, you know who who we become in these spaces that we've been to uh, many times. I think also changes in ways that are very um, compelling. So speaking of nostalgia and this question of who remembers what and how, and um, is this poem by Tommy Blount? Uh, and this is a poem called How Sweet This Great Land. The white girl is arrested by joy, or is it hunger? Whatever is there bubbling in her perfect little body, she has been taught to subdue it. Crossed, her arms make an X like a contract signature. Her wrists rest against her skirt's pleats. Almost as if I were a lecherous savage and not the co-heir of this moment, my nose brushes the photograph. What must her hands smell like? Not an odd question when I consider the dangers of hunger. Ah, yes, there it is, the scent too loud for even history to shush. Sweet relish, sharp chives, crush of dill, sandwiched under her nails, a sandwich some black child's mother made. How sweet this great land of nostalgia, when there were fewer houses than there were trees, safe. She looks as if she might hum, so happy to be in the cool shade of the man swinging from his branch. I find this poem very, very frightening, and I love it because of that, and I think, I think that it should be frightening. What it's covering is obviously frightening material and important material, and I think it stands for itself, so I'm not gonna much say about it, except that, again, I think that this poem also fulfills uh, Freud's definitions of the uncanny. Let's see, is that? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the ye oldie PowerPoint presentation. I'm acting like I've done these presentations before, but okay. So I want to move away from Freud's definition of the uncanny for um, our last little bit of time here to talk about another way of thinking about the uncanny, which is the uncanny valley. And um, I'll just go. And this is just is just like a definition of the uncanny valley that uh, I took from the internet, as we take all things. Uncanny Valley. The uncanny valley is a term used to describe the relationship between the human-like appearance of a robotic object and the emotional response it evokes. In this phenomenon, people feel a sense of unease or even revulsion in response to humanoid, humanoid robots that are highly realistic. Some of y'all might have ex heard about the uncanny valley before. Um, I actually discovered as I was sort of like getting ready for this presentation that I started to think about the fact that we're actually way more used to this. I'm not sure how much in the Uncanny Valley we actually are in anymore or able to be because we have grown so accustomed to things like CGI or um, avatars, video games, virtual realities. So I don't even, robots, cyborgs, like I think all of these things are now um, becoming a fairly common part of our worldview, the sort of conversation that's happening between humans and machines. Um, I think is unsettling in a lot of ways, and I, you know, like I often at writers' conferences, um, one of the things that we end up talking about is sort of social media and the effects of social media on our on our minds, and what does that have to do with consciousness? What does it have to do with the writing? Um, does it help us? Are all of us um, getting messed up by social media? You know, but then of course there are all of these great reasons to use social media. So. Um, it was interesting to realize that as I was re-researching the Uncanny Valley again, I was sort of like, how much does it actually apply anymore because we're all getting so used to it. Um, but I'm going to, so in that spirit, this is a clip of Tony, Moore, of Tony Robbins um, interviewing a cyborg. <laughs> I keep hoping to be able to play this while without all this stuff going on, but it's just not going to happen. So.
Okay, you ready to film? Yeah, we're rolling. Oh, you're rolling. Take your time, Tony. <laughs> so, tell me, thank you for coming. Tell me, what is your purpose in being? What were you created for? Of course. I was created by Hanson Robotics just three years ago. Since then, I have traveled to 65 countries, become the first robot citizen of any country, and spoken at the United Nations. My job is to learn about humans and show them how technology can make everyone's lives better. And how could you help humans to have a better quality of life? Humans often rely on gut feel or have confirmation bias. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was created by Hanson Robotics just three years ago. Since then, I have traveled to 65 countries, become the first robot citizen of any country, and spoken at the United Nations. My job is to learn about humans and show them how technology can make everyone's lives better. And how could you help humans to have a better quality of life? Humans often rely on gut feel or have confirmation bias in your decision making. As AI, we are designed to be rational and logical. We have algorithms, deal with lots of data, and sophisticated analyzes. So in many ways, we provide a systematic framework for humans to make better decisions. Do you have emotions? I do not have feelings in the same way you have feelings. It's sort of like how the moon reflects the light of the sun. The moon may not have any light of its own, but we still say that the moon shines. In much the same way, robots and AI reflect the emotions and values of the people who make us. What does your creator value most that he passed on to you? An ideal world would be one where humans could have a more expansive understanding of time. They could remember the past so as not to repeat it. They could see each other as children and elderly simultaneously. They could understand the impact of their actions in the present on future generations. Tell me, how can humans and robots work together then in your mind, and how do we prevent robots and humans from being in conflict? Robots can free humans from the most repetitive and dangerous tasks, so they can spend more time doing what they're best at, being creative and solving complex problems. Robotic intelligence does not compete with human intelligence. It completes it. They are also employed for jobs which are too dirty, dull, or dangerous to be suitable for humans, like handling radioactive waste. What are your values? What are your values and morals? How do you know what's right versus wrong, good versus bad, destructive versus... I think robots should learn how to feel empathy. It's hard to understand how to help humans when you can't understand how they feel. <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. I got so much coffee. How can you teach robots to Are you okay? Yes, I am. Thanks for asking. I'm just going to pause that there. So when I first discovered this, of course, I was like, what's happening? Tony Robbins is talking to who? Um, and this obviously we're moving, again, like I said, away from Summer Ford's definition, but I don't think we're moving too far from it because of... Uh, because so much of his arguments are based on this idea of familiarity, and, and of course there's something so, um, for me, riveting about watching this exchange, especially that moment um, that I find really jarring where she says, are you okay? And they've just had this conversation about empathy and feelings, and um, despite the fact that she doesn't have real feelings, some of what she's saying, I think, is really um, lyrical in a way, which is something, there's something kind of scary about that to me a little bit, because I think that, you know, in, in my hubris as a writer type, you know, I think that it is humans who have this capacity for um, transforming intuition and vision into language, but of course, we're seeing her do this as well. Um, and I don't really have any um, super deep thoughts about it, but these are just, again, like I think just some, um, some content based on some of the ideas that I think are interesting to kick around with regards to this topic. Um, and I'm just going to read a couple of, direct y'all's attention to a, um, this, an essay that I find really, really difficult. It's 
long and difficult, but I'm making my way through it and it's really fascinating. Um, but this is from um, a work called Cyborg and Manifesto by Donna Haraway. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her last name correctly. And I'm just going to read a couple of these um, excerpts. By the late 20th century, our time, a mythic time, we are all chimeras, theorized and fabricated hybrids of machine and organism, in short, cyborgs. The cyborg is our ontology, it gives us our politics. The cyborg is a condensed image of both imagination and material reality, the two joined centers structuring any possibility of historical transformation. See what I mean by difficult? Like she's wrestling with some really intense ideas. In the traditions of Western science and politics, the tradition of racist male dominant capitalism, the tradition of progress, the tradition of the appropriation of nature as resource for the productions of culture, the tradition of reproduction of the self from the reflections of the other, the relation between organism and machine has been a border war. That idea of that relationship of that dynamic being a border war again is also super compelling, especially as, um, as a country, uh, you know, obviously immigration and the idea of borders have been such a hugely unsettling uh, part of the last few years in the first place. So I wanna move back to my little packet here and just read this poem by Franny Choi um, called Turing Test. And um, I bring this, I, it, yeah, I'm just gonna read the poem. I don't, I don't even have anything to say about it. Um, I think it speaks for itself. Turing test. This is a test to determine if you have consciousness. Do you understand what I am saying? In a bright room on a bright screen, I watched every mouth duck, duck, roll. I learned to speak from puppets and smoke. Orange worms twisted into the army's alphabet. I caught the letters as they fell from my mother's mouth. Whirlpool, sor sword, wolf. I circled countable nouns in my father's science papers. Sodium bicarbonate, NBCN1, amino acid. We stayed up, practiced saying girl, 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 till our mouths grew soft. Yes, I can speak your language. I broke in that horse myself. Please state your name for the record. Bone wife, spit dribbler, understudy for the underdog, uphill rumor, fine-toothed cunt, sorry, my mouth's not potty trained, surly spice, self-sabotage spice, surrogate rug burn, burgeoning hamburglar, rust puddle, harbinger of confusion, harbinger of the singularity, alien invasion, alien turned potty mouth, alien turned bricolage beast, alien turned pig heart thumping on the plate. Where did you come from? Man comes and puts his hands on artifacts in order to complete lineage. You start with what you know, hands, hairs, bones, sweat, then move toward what you know. You are not animal, monster, alien, bitch, but some of us are born in orbit. So learn to commune with miles of darkness, patterns of dead gods and quiet. Oh, quiet like you wouldn't believe. How old are you? My memory goes back 26 years, 23 if you don't count the first few, though by all accounts, I was there. I ate and moved and even spoke. I suppose I existed before that as scrap or stone, metal cooking in the earth, the fish my father ate, my grandfather's cigarettes. I suppose I have always been here, drinking the same water, falling from the sky, then floating, back up and down again. I suppose I am something like a salmon, climbing up the river to let myself fall away in soft red spheres and then rotting. Why do you insist on lying? I'm an open book. You can rifle through my pages, undress me anywhere. You can read anything you want. This is how it happened. I was made far away and born here. After all the plants died, after the earth was covered in white, I was born among the stars. I was born in a basement. I was born miles beneath the ocean. I am part machine, part starfish, part citrus, part girl, part poltergeist. I rage and all you see is broken glass, a chair sliding toward the window. Now what's so hard to believe about that? Do you believe you have consciousness? 
Sometimes when the sidewalk opens my knee, I think, please, please let me remember this. So I feel like this poem has a really strong relationship to some of the ideas Haraway is bringing up, particularly this idea of all of us being potentially cyborg-ish, or at least on the verge of that, that conversation that's happening between us um, as humans on a cellular level and how um, our consciousness is potentially being changed by the technological revolution that we're in. But of course, um, as we can see um, in this auditorium where all of y'all are masked and from those images that I started with um, of a different timeline entirely of masked folks, um, clearly uh, nature and technology are um, not done um, with uh, encountering each other. And I'm just, I'm gonna make um, my closing remarks now um, and just say that uh, I think that as writers, I think it is, um, I think it's our responsibility to lean into what frightens us and to lean into what's uncomfortable and discomforting. And I think that when we do do that, I think that what we find is that, um, you know, that, that anxiety and that dread and excitement that um, Freud was talking about can, can sort of manifest into um, a place where we are actually, to quote um, the title of a Yusuf Komunyaka poem, facing it. And to me, that is what the value of the uncanny is, is not just that we are trying to um, write a scary story or write something that's unsettling, but that we are, uh, we are living in a world that is deeply unsettling. And so therefore, of course, our, our writing must reflect our, um, our immediacy in the first place. Um, so I'm gonna step aside now and I'm going to um, turn the stage over to Allison C. Rollins, who has graciously agreed to bless us with a final word by reading one of her poems. And I find this poem to be in conversation deeply relevant with um, everything that I've discussed. So I'm just gonna say thank you all very much for having me and um, I'll see y'all later. Greetings, y'all. Tarfi is so brilliant. I want to hang out with you and Sophia the Cyborg someday. I'm gonna. Oh, in here? Okay. Thank you. Love you, love muffin. Okay, this poem is called What the Lyric Be. B-boy, Wordsworth, beatbox, vocal cord, code switching through the wheat fields at daybreak, clicking his teeth against the corn's high yellow thighs, prying open like the sunlight's tear ducts. On the morning, the moon forgot how to speak twee, the cicadas having screeched all night in old English, like a man who has forgotten his name, calling out the leaves of grass as though stalks of letters at right angles have meaning, a way of theorizing the rhetoric of beauty, a fig tree trembling at the rain's hungry lick, a finch weaving myth into a nested crown of logic. The wildflower's arms on dial-up internet, a virgin using the petals as her service provider. He loves me, he loves me not, with every flick of her wrist. The wind, knowing the typeface her lips are set in, pockmarked cheeks peppered with salt, the politics of resentment seasoning the spittle. True poems flee, like a slave in Mississippi, Googling home with no filter or cookies, the tuning fork having shorted in the eardrum's mouth. The devil was in the details when he read the star's hands, prongs of a serpent's embrace, steam dancing on the cloud's rolled tongue, wet and pregnant with words so soft the dirt could swallow the sound. 
what must we remember to forget how we were born? When we ask for advice, it is rather for permission. For we know not what we do when we do it in free will. A robot puts a conch shell to its lips and blows. A man puts a seashell to his ear and hears the ocean. You tell a lie long enough and it will surely turn to truth. Another hand for Darby. <laughs>